morning and welcome to Woodland Community Church. Glad to see you, uh, those of you that are in the building here and uh, those of you at home. Uh, you know, I've always kind of shied away from donating blood, needles, and things, but this weekend I went on the church camping trip. Yes, the mosquitoes helped me donate lots of blood. But we're doing the camping trip one more time, July 10th, 11th, and it is going to be a great time. We so enjoyed our time with uh, some Woodlanders and uh, Tim Peterson. Just want to give a thank you to him who had canoes there for us, and we did some fishing, and it was just a great time camping. So uh, if you are available, July 10th and 11th, they're going to do that camping trip one more time up by the Flambeau River. Uh, Pastor Michael also would like me to announce that the high school youth group is tonight uh, at their home in Rib Lake, uh, high school youth group at the Bankies. We also have uh, the ladies' study that is kicked off on Tuesday nights uh, here at the church. So that is going. Uh, ladies, 6.30, I believe, is the time there. And then uh, this afternoon, uh, our church family also uh, is invited to the Luke Blumberg graduation party at their home on Up John uh, Road. Okay, well, Pastor Michael and I also squeezed some time in to get together this week and did uh, another checking in on some woodlanders. to another edition of Woodlands Checking Checkin in. in. Hey, I'm so excited because today we're going to go visit the Orthmans. All right, Mr. O was a longtime band director here at Rib Lake. I think we should put a little march in our step as we head over there. What did you have in mind, Brad? We're here to check in on you. Uh, we thought we'd honor you with a band ensemble, but that might have been bad. <laughs> well, actually, you were both in step. Oh, well, we're in step. <laughs> we'll take Not that. Not with each other, but in step. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come on in. All right. Thanks, Thanks for welcoming us in, our friends. Oh, you're welcome. Come you're in. You're welcome. What have you guys been up to? Well, this one is... A thousand pieces, I think. We one, don't, we we don't look trick. at the picture. Okay. You cannot look at the box. Oh, oh you're hardcore. Yeah, no that's kidding. our secret. <laughs> My goodness. So it's called a hundred cats and a fish, I think. <laughs> so we are finished these two. Yeah. Okay. And in case the virus runs a while, <laughs> we have plans for the next six months or a year. <laughs> you got plans. <laughs> Great. Well, Ned, I, I hear there's a Bible verse that you, you live by, and, and I'd like to hear more about it. Well, I, I'm not going to quote it entirely because my mind kind of has gone to random access memory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, but it, basically it's uh, Psalm 27, verse 1, which says, If God is my light salvation, yeah. for who, uh, whom shall I be afraid? So even with this virus, I am cautious, mm -hmm. but, but not, not afraid. necessarily afraid of it. Yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know, for about the last month, maybe two months now, there's been a, a verse that has been on my mind. and Brian talked about it last week in his sermon, the uh, Matthew 22. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not going to try to quote it, mm -hmm. but it's the, the, the two great commandments. And if we're supposed to love our neighbor, why is it that we can hate so easily right now? Hmm. And, and they're so divided over every little thing. It seems like we have to pick a side and not try to agree with anybody. I just yeah. would like to see give and take in, in the world. All right, and Anne, what's your uh, favorite verse? Well, my favorite verse is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But I won't quote it because Brian already did Brian Hersky's <laughs> favorite verse as well. All right, way to go, Brian. And that's cool. It's a good one to live by. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Brad, do you remember when you and Corey used to come and spend a weekend or a few days here when your parents went on retreat? I sure do. <laughs> and what happened that one year when you were finally old enough that you and Corey could stay home alone? What did you decide to do? Well... I couldn't pass up a chance to be at the Orthmans. <laughs> so you came over. That was great. Yeah. I was like 33. 
No, it's great. Thank you. Those are some really great memories. You spoiled us. I think oh, we enjoyed you so much. You I remember enjoyed. going to Pizza Hut, I think, one time. And oh, oh nice. right. You know, Ned and Ann, I, you know, you've been part of this church for a while, from what I understand. Could you just tell us a little bit more about how you got connected to Woodland, when and, and how that happened? Well, to start with, I was a Catholic, and Ned always came to church with me, although he never converted to becoming a Catholic. We raised mm -hmm. our children Catholic. Okay. And then, you know, I wanted to start looking around. There were other friends that I had that were also looking around and seeing. So um, one of the things that helped me step into the Woodland Church was getting to know people that were going to Woodland, sure. like the camp people. And we would go take our kids out to the camp mm -hmm. for swimming lessons every summer. And that was kind of opening a door to getting to know these people. And even Ned went for swimming lessons. Well, I, I never could swim, so I went out there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it was cold. Yeah, I heard it was cold. <laughs> but they tried to teach me to swim, and a couple of different summers, I went out there about three, six weeks at a time. Yeah. And they finally said, you can't swim. <laughs> Just one of those things, and if you ever fall out of a boat, take a deep breath and run along the bottom for sure. And then the other thing that got me understanding not being afraid to go into the structure of the Woodland Church mm -hmm. was that they put on a series of Focus on the Family by James Dobson, and it was uh, probably a six-week series or something. And mm. uh, I thought it would be fun to go up there and, you know, it's in the evening, so this doesn't bother anything that I'm doing as a Catholic. So we went into the church and, you know, it, nothing struck me. I mean, it wasn't a cult. People were quite nice. <laughs> so we got to thinking maybe this is our new church. Mm, cool. So. Okay, thanks, Orthmans. That was great talking with you. Well, thanks for checking. Well, we're going to march on out of here. All right, here we go. <laughs> Take care. That was great checking in on the Orthmans. They are such neat people. Yeah, they sure are. You know what, this summer with all the, the parades being canceled, we are missing listening to the band march down the streets. But you band students, I'm sure, are not missing having to wear these uniforms. Man, are they warm. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> all right, well, that'll end this week's edition of Woodlands Checking Check In. in. Well, welcome to Woodland Community Church this morning. And as we uh, begin to, to think about worshiping God and music this morning, I just want to open up in a psalm that will focus our attention on God's grace and what he has done for us. But psalm 32, he says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the man, the Lord, is, does not charge with sin. I acknowledge my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity, and you took away the guilt of my sin. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. And this morning we're going to open up with a hymn, The Wonderful Grace of Jesus. And as we, as we uh, really think about the words of this hymn, it just really strikes me that as, as we ponder God's grace, that what he has done for us, you know, this morning I was driving in here to church and uh, there's a message on the radio about a guy that, that he was using an analogy of, of us standing in a courtroom before a judge and how we have the prosecuting attorney and we have the defense attorney. And um, that the prosecuting attorney is there to point out everything that we have done wrong. And the defense attorney is there to defend us and say, this person is innocent, and um, I'm here to, to acknowledge that before the judge, that this person could, should go th free. And it's not that we have gone free because of our own works, but because of what Jesus Christ has, has paid for our penalties that we deserve, and he has pardoned us from the iniquities of our sins. So this morning, as we stand and uh, sing Wonderful Grace of Jesus, Really think about these words as, as we really ponder the grace of Jesus in our own lives. So let's stand.
Today we are also recognizing the day of the uh, Christian martyr. Um, martyrdom is part of uh, Christian history. Um, ever since Jesus went uh, went up, um, there has been Christians who have been laying down their lives for their faith because that has ha- it just cost them their faith. Um, and so it's nothing new to us to to hear about and think about martyrdom, having to lay down your life for your faith. And in fact, it's something that Jesus commanded us and uh, warned all who would follow him um, to be, be prepared for. Jesus says in Luke 9 verse 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And so although here in America, we don't have this on our minds a lot, we don't live in an environment where um, having to lay down our life and, and really considering having to be crucified in a way for our faith is not really on our mind. It's definitely something present in our world, though. There are places throughout the world that we have Christian brothers and sisters who are facing this kind of persecution. And although we don't face it in this uh, sense today um, in our in our nation, we still have to have this mindset. We still have to have this preparedness about our faith that if push gets to shove, what are we going to do? When, when, when our faith is on the line. And so our prayer this morning is that we would con- continue to carry on that command, that, 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 that desire to be able to show this world that our faith is even more valuable to us than our lives. So we're going to remember those and also lift up others who, who, are, who are facing this kind of persecution this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you came, that you brought salvation, you saved us from our sin. Lord, you have given us eternal life. There's nothing greater that we can ask for, that we can desire, even even greater than life itself. And so, Lord, um, this morning, as we remember the Christians who have died because of their faith, because they were following you, Lord, we, we want to remember them, and we also want to lift up our brothers and sisters living throughout the world in different areas who are facing that kind of persecution, where their lives are on the line. And we just ask that you give them strength, give them encouragement, and, and perseverance and help them keep their eyes set on you 
when, when this world is trying to tear them down and pull them away from you. So, Lord, we ask that you'd keep them, keep their families. We especially think of pastors who are, who are gathering congregations where, where it's not allowed. And, and we just ask that you would just be at work in those congregations, grow them, and, and allow them to be influencing their communities. Lord, we also want to pray for the Christians in our nation, Lord. Although we don't face that kind of person, persecution today, Lord, it could happen to us. And, and there's different kinds of persecution that we face. So, Lord, may you give us boldness in our faith that we would stand up um, when, when uh, our enemies would oppose us. And, Lord, that we would put you on as our greatest good and that our faith would be the, evidenced by, our, by the way that we live, by the way that we love, by the way that we witness to who you are, Lord, so that you can be glorified and that we can receive our full reward in heaven as you welcome us home. And so, Lord, we thank you for being with us and helping us during trying times. We just ask that you'd give us a heart to be prepared to give all that we have for you because we know that we have everything in you. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives and through us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Michael. You know, as I was uh, pondering this morning, even the, the, this morning being the, 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 the Sunday of the persecuted church, um, something that came to mind, I was watching a couple videos this morning on uh, just people over in other countries that are being persecuted for their faith. And it, it helped me to be able to think through a little bit about how would I respond if, that, if I was facing the same thing. You know, one of my roles at, uh, at Four Springs is uh, risk management and emergency planning. And uh, one of the things I do with our, our staff every year is we, we go through scenarios on emergency management uh, planning at, at camp with our staff. And we, we think through in our brains, what will you do in the case of an emergency. And uh, you know, one of the things we, I find is that when you plan and prepare for the worst possible scenario, then you're ready to deal with everything else that comes up underneath that. And you know, it, one of the terms I use with our staff is we want to be prepared, not paranoid. And I th I, as I think about that, even in, with the persecution, that right now in our country, we don't have to face that. But someday, we probably will. And as we think through and prepare ourselves, what are we doing as Christians and as the church to prepare ourselves for what we will face in the future and how we can even support our Christian brothers and sisters around the world in what they are facing today. So as we think through that, we, even with our faith in Christ, uh, let's think about how we can be prepared but not paranoid. So this morning, just uh, we're going to sing a song by faith uh, by the Gettys uh, who wrote that. And just a real powerful words there that can really help us to focus uh, how we live by faith. Let's go and stand.
sing this next song, that we are called to be God's people. It's a familiar hymn, and Jan's going to go ahead and play it through one time for us. But you know, one of the things, I, I think I've mentioned this before a little bit, but as we think about um, what pastor's going to be talking about in regards to faith and works and how they, they go together uh, in our Christian lives, the imagery of reflection is, is powerful in, in my mind. And as we think about uh, when we look in a lake and we see the calmness of the water, that um, it's amazing how when that, that water is so calm that sometimes you look at the trees or the mountains and the reflection of that image in the water, the, the more smooth that water is, the clearer that reflection is. And, uh, you know, as we, as we look at our lives with Christ and that um, as Jesus is the real image, that we are a reflection of Jesus Christ himself. And when those waters are distorted, the image becomes pretty distorted. And uh, our goal as Christians is to get so close to Jesus Christ that we as his reflections are as clear as possible. And so often people take their, instead of looking at the real image, they start to focus on the reflection. And when that reflection is distorted, it uh, distorts the real image. And our goal is to direct people back to the real image of who Jesus Christ is in our lives. So as we sing this song, uh, we are called to be God's people Again, these words are powerful, and as we associate them with, uh, with our faith and our works, let's uh, begin to focus our hearts and our minds on what we're here about to learn about in uh, Scripture this morning. So, go ahead, Jan.
Thanks for leading us this morning, Dave, and it's great to see all of you who are here in person, as uh, well as to be seen by all of you who are uh, here this morning on the stream. It's been a week of highs and lows, hasn't it, in our state, our nation, um, even our immediate region. Uh, I tell you, a high for me, we've had a couple of highs, one of them was Uh, seeing or hearing about our women's gathering on Tuesday evenings. Uh, A great number of you ladies joined uh, each other here in our Grove area, our children's education area, for just a a time to be together and be in the Word together. And that is not to be taken for granted these days. Uh, Another high for me was our campout Friday evening and Saturday. I see a number of you that are scratching a little bit, um, who were there with us, and it's, it's fantastic to be able to gather in a smaller group, uh, again, not to be taken for granted, but wonderful to be out with you on the Flambeau, and there's another trip, another such trip coming in a couple of weeks, and I think there's still a few spots left for that, and so let's, let's look for any opportunity to join each other and be together. It's been a week of lows, though, too. If you've watched the news and tried to follow what has gone on, particularly in our state uh, this week, uh, mobs in Madison, house burnings, uh, a senator beat up, uh, the tearing down of statues, most notably a statue of a famous abolitionist, if you can get your mind around that. In our nation, the legacies of people like Abraham Lincoln and even Martin Luther King Jr. are being challenged. Uh, Funny that we'd live to see the day when when, uh, Abraham Lincoln would be on the wrong side of history, but that's the the storyline that is developing here. Uh, These were not perfect men by any means, but they represent a history that I think we all believe needs to be studied. And if we don't learn from that history, then some of the first victims uh, are going to be those who are, who, are, who are protesting at the moment. We need to learn from our history. Um, Karl Marx, no friend of Christianity, said, a people without a past are easily persuaded. Think about that for a minute as we do away with some of our history as a nation. Uh, We don't want to repeat those mistakes. And it also makes me think of who we are as followers of Jesus. We are a people with a past. We are rooted in what God has done at creation and what Jesus has done at the cross. We're also a people with a future because of that past. And it's Because we're a people with a past that we turn to James 2. Why don't we go there together right now in our Bibles. James 2, starting in verse 14. We're going to go down through 26 today. The theme of this section in James is faith producing spiritual fruit within the church of God. He's talked about faith producing spiritual fruit toward God. That was the first section of the book. Now he's talking in this larger middle section about uh, our faith uh, producing spiritual fruit toward one another as God's people. He starts off in verse 19 with our demeanor toward other people. We're to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That should be our demeanor toward each other, particularly when we disagree on things. What a contrast to what we're seeing in the world around us right now. And as we interact with each other this way, we're to receive God's word with obedience. Verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. We know how James does this by now. He'll bring up a theme, he'll mention it, like in verse 22, and then later on, sometimes several chapters later, he'll do a deep dive 
into that particular topic. And this morning is the deep dive into this idea about what it means to be doers of the word and not hearers only. He's going to talk about active saving faith in contrast to dead passive faith that is mental assent only. We're doing another thing here at Woodland. We're memorizing this book together. We're collectively memorizing the entire book of James. That means different ones of us have grabbed parts of it and we've memorized it this morning. Gary and Steve are those who have memorized this section. They're tag teaming on this. The passage got a little long, so they're helping each other on this. And let's hear God's word recited. James 2, verses 14 through 19. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food, and one of you says to them, Go, be well, stay warm and well fed, but does nothing about their daily needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say to you, You have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You say you believe in one God, but so do the demons, and they shudder. James 2, 20-26 You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see, a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not even Ahab, Rahab the prostitute considered righteous by what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Lord, we thank you for this passage this morning, and we'd ask you to help us to rightly understand and then apply what you are teaching us through this passage this morning. Amen. Is anybody thinking a little bit right now? That's kind of a hard passage, isn't it? You've got these important words, faith, works, justification. They're used in a particular way. Let's talk about how this, uh, these words work together and what James is doing here. The first thing we need to understand is that James is addressing a mistaken understanding about faith and works. The mistaken understanding is simply this. You can have one without the other. That's the basic idea of this mistaken understanding about how faith and works works work together. Here in verse 14, you, you see the problem. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Think about this variety of faith. It exists. It's just out there. It's like somebody says, yeah, I believe, but there's no evidence. There, there, there's no good work. There are no good deeds. What words would you use to describe that faith? Think about that a little bit. I might use words like passive, unproven, assumed, casual, self-centered. And there's one really good word. Let's see if you can guess what it is. James gives us an illustration to help us. Verse 15, look at that verse again. Here you have a brother or a sister, poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. And, and what does the church member say to this person who is in need? 
good luck. That's what they say. They see this person in need and they're like, wow, you are in trouble. Um, good luck. Be warmed and filled. They give them a blessing that just kind of disappears into the air, but they don't do anything to try to help the person who is in need. James wants us to know that this faith demonstrates spiritual deadness. That's the word. That faith is dead. And then James has this little phrase that he uses throughout the passage, what good is that? What, what good is dead faith? Here's a question that we have to answer in this pass, passage. Who is this someone? You, you see this someone in verse 14. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? You're going to see a direct quote by this someone later on in verse 18. Who is this someone? To answer that question, we need to go into the life situation uh, of the early church that, that resulted in this book being written by James. We've argued earlier that James was written somewhere in the years 44 to 47 of the first century. I think it's written in the year 46. Not certain of that. That's my best guess, and I can tell you why that is. Turn to Acts 11, if you would. Acts 11, the end of the book of the uh, chapter of Acts 11, verse 27. This is a passage that is paralleled by Galatians 2, 1 to 10. So you may want to look up those verses later on. Galatians 2, 1 to 10, they parallel Acts 11, 27 to 30. These verses describe Barnabas and Paul going to Jerusalem. Listen to what they say. Now, in these days... Prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Antioch is in what is today Syria. It's in the north. You always go up to Jerusalem, so you go down north to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul, better known to us as Paul. And then as you get into chapter 12, you read what happened then. First verse, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And then we read that James is killed. This is not James, the writer of our letter. This is James, the brother of John, one of, the, of Peter, James, and John fame. He's killed, and then Peter is imprisoned. And look, now you have the setting for the book of James. There's famine, there's poverty, there's persecution, James is leading the church in Jerusalem, but very importantly, who is with him? Paul is with him in Jerusalem. Look at the last verse of chapter 12. And Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service. So Paul is in Jerusalem for chapter 11. Chapter 12, sorry, of the book of Acts. What's Paul doing in Jerusalem? Well, I bet Paul is teaching in Jerusalem. And what is Paul teaching about? Well, we, we know this by reading all of Paul's letters that hadn't been written yet. I bet Paul is teaching about faith. And he's saying things like, he will say a few years later in the book of Romans. Romans 3, 28. This is what Paul is saying about faith. 
For we hold that one is justified, how? By faith, apart from the works of the law. Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And Ephesians 2, 8. By grace you have been saved through, what? Faith. For Paul, faith always means saving trust in the Lord Jesus. Don't forget that. That's what Paul is teaching. Paul is also teaching about works, particularly works of the law. Galatians will be written by my reckoning just two years later after this passage. I put Galatians in the year 48. This is what Paul says about works, Galatians 3, 10 and 11. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Romans 3.28, we just read it, we'll read it, read it again. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from what? Works of the law. For Paul, works usually, but not always, means obedience to the law of Moses. Don't forget that. Obedience to the law of Moses. This is the Old Testament law that God gave to Israel. It had a place in its time. The law showed Israel how to remain in the land of promise. You obey the law, you get to stay in the land of promise. The law shows us our sin, continues to do that today. The law points us to Jesus, the most important important function of the law, but the law can't by itself save. That's what Paul wants us to know by works of the law. Thirdly, and lastly, Paul, well, not lastly, but thirdly of our three terms, Paul is talking about justification. This is how we're made righteous or how we are declared righteous. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, justification is a legal term meaning to declare righteous. He uses this in a a forensic legal way. Picture a, a courtroom and the judge looks at the guilty party and says, you're guilty, but the penalty for your sin has been paid Therefore, I declare you righteous. That's how Paul is using it. Not to make righteous, but to declare righteous. Faith, works, justification. This is what Paul is talking about in Jerusalem. Now, here's what we need to remember. James agrees with Paul. They're saying the same thing in different ways. We know this because in Acts 15, we read about the Jerusalem Council, which I'm going to put in the year 48. So two years later, Paul and Barnabas come back to Jerusalem, and there have been some people that have been saying that Gentiles, non-Jews, can only be right with God if they obey the law of Moses. And Paul and Barnabas debate them in Antioch, and finally they're dispatched to Jerusalem, and they go to Jerusalem, and they make their case before the apostles, and the apostles bring their verdict. They weigh in. This is what they say. This is Acts 15, verses 8 and 9. And God, who knows the heart bore witness to them, that's the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts, how? By faith. And then in verse 19, a few verses down, Acts 15, here's James. This is the same James who's writing the epistle that we're reading. He says, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turned to God. He agrees with the rest of the apostles. He agrees with 
Paul and Barnabas. So, you did a good job of listening. I see everybody is trying really hard. That's, but that's the life situation that's going on in Acts 11 and 12 and in James 2 as this passage is being written. Here's the question again. Who is this someone in verses 14 and 18? This someone is someone, whether real or not, doesn't matter, who has misunderstood Paul's teaching. This someone has misunderstood Paul to mean that faith is mere mental assent. You see something, you get the information, and you say, yep, I get it, that's what that means, but you don't do anything about it. And, and for this person, faith doesn't look like anything. There's no proof of it. There's no evidence. This someone is a Christian in name only. And James would say, this person isn't even saved. The second part of our passage is about the right understanding of faith and works. And here it is. Good deeds evidence saving faith. Good deeds Evidence, they don't save, but they evidence saving faith. Look at the someone again here. In verse 18, you see this word faith used in a couple of different ways. You have faith, first of all, this is the someone. You have faith, and I have works. That's what the someone, the person who has misunderstood Paul, is saying. He's saying one person has active and engaged faith, okay. Another person has passive faith and believes without evidence. Also okay. Maybe there are even two different ways to get to God. One person does stuff, the other person says they do stuff. Doesn't matter. James's point is that if you say that, you someone who has misunderstood Paul, I will show you my faith by my works. Notice how he is using faith in two different ways in verse 18. For James, faith in the second sense, in in the saving sense, means genuine dependence on Jesus. This is the way Paul uses the word faith. It doesn't mean mere mental assent, the way that the someone is using the word faith. For James, works means, this is important, loving deeds. Right? You believe in Jesus and then you respond by loving other people. He does not mean works of the law, like Paul uses the term. For Paul, uh, works is often a negative term because it means trying to obey the law in order to be saved. He says you can't do that. For James, he's using works in a positive way to mean loving deeds. For James, loving deeds serve as evidence of saving faith. Saving faith in Jesus looks like something. That's what James wants us to know. And then to make this point, he has a number of arguments. We'll go through them quickly. He has, first of all, the arguments from none other than demons. It's a little scary. But he says, you believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. You know, Satan has impeccable theology. Satan gets the gospel. Mentally, he understands who Jesus is. Just look at the temptation passages in the gospels. He gets it. He knew what Jesus was trying to do. He knew what Jesus was going to do. He he believes in Jesus. He has faith in Jesus in the sense of mental assent. But you know what his problem is? He's unredeemable. Jesus didn't come to save demons. He came to save image bearers of God. He did not die for Satan. Satan will not be saved and will not be redeemed. We learned something important here about about the gospel. The gospel involves information. Yes, 
Jesus is the Son of God. He came. He died on the cross. There's information in that. And, and yes, it involves mental assent. I need to believe in my mind that Jesus did this, that something happened. But you know what else the gospel includes? It involves trust. It involves me depending on Jesus and not myself, not works of the law, in order to be saved. If we understand the gospel, if you you understand the gospel, but you only look at it and say, yep, that's it, I get it, James would say that you're not even saved. You see how he's using the terms differently. He's not disagreeing with Paul. Then he gives us an argument from Scripture. And he talks about Abraham. He talks about Rahab. Really quickly, three important passages in Abraham's life. Do you know what they are? Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 22. In Genesis 12, God says, Abraham, go to the land. I will show you. I will make you a great nation. You know what Abraham does? He obeys God. He, 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 he does what God tells him to do even before he knows very much about this great God who is telling him what to do. Chapter 15, he's in the land. He's obeyed God, but he has no offspring. He has no son. God, how is this going to work? Because like I'm really old and I have no heir. God says, go out underneath the night sky and look at the stars. Your offspring is going to be like these stars. And he, that's Abraham, believed the Lord. And he, that's God, counted it to Abraham as righteousness. Then in chapter 22, Genesis, God told Abraham to offer Isaac on the altar. That doesn't make any sense, right? He's got the heir. He's got the son. The son needs to live. But Abraham believes sincerely that God is going to resurrect Isaac if he obeys. God stayed his hand. He didn't offer his son on the altar, but Abraham was willing to obey God. And in doing so, he gave evidence of his faith. You see how it works? Abraham believes first, and then he demonstrates that faith by loving deeds, good deeds. You know, the the verse that troubles us here is verse 22. Let's read it again carefully. You see that faith uh, was active along with his works, No, it's not verse 22. You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. That's still talking about Abraham. Uh, For faith, Abraham, faith looked like something. Here's the difficult verse. We're coming to it. Verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. This makes perfect sense if we recognize how James is using these terms like we've been talking about. He's not disagreeing with Paul. We don't have contradictions in the Bible. James is using the word works here to mean loving deeds, not works of the law, as Paul uses the term. He's using the word faith here in the first sense the sense of the someone that he's quoting, to mean mental assent, not saving faith. He's using the word justified here to to mean vindicated or to publicly prove. You know, James's older brother was Jesus, right? James often uses words in the same way that Jesus used them. Here he's using this word justified in the sense in which Jesus used the word, not in the technical sense in which Paul used the word. If you want proof for that, you can look at Matthew eleven nineteen. This is Jesus. Jesus says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. In other words, wisdom is publicly proven. Wisdom is vindicated. 
So, if we want to summarize all this together, let's translate verse 20, 24 by plugging in the way that James is using these terms. This will be our woodland translation for this, is, for this morning in context with how James is talking about it. This is how verse 24 should read. You see that a person is publicly proven or publicly proved by loving deeds and not by mental assent only. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And you see how James is using these words to perfectly agree with Paul. Last verse of the passage, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. That's his picture of the human body. The human body has a soul. It also has breath. That word spirit can mean either one here. But, but you, you, you've got to have breath. You've got to have a soul for a body to be animated and to be alive. That's his picture here. Ugh. You did so well. All week I'm praying about this passage. Lord, help us not to be confused, especially by verse 24, which is not a memory verse that I would memorize in isolation without understanding the context of what James is doing. There's a little poem that can help us remember the meaning of this passage. Next time you're reading through it, and you say, ooh, that's not quite what I've been taught, James 2. Remember this poem. We're saved by faith in Christ alone, but faith that saves is not alone. We're saved by faith in Christ alone, but faith that saves is not alone. That's what James wants us to know. That's what Paul wants us to know. You know, the American church needs this passage right now. We are headed into a time of refinement. I really believe that as an American church. As an American in the American church, I want it to be a time of revival as well. But I believe it's going to be harder to follow Jesus soon. And we're going to be misunderstood. And those who only give mental assent to Jesus are going to melt away. It, it's not a time for do -de do Christianity. It's not a time just to turn up and sing the hymns and check off and say, yep, Jesus, thumbs up and then go away and be like the man who looks at his face in the mirror and then goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. We need to depend on Jesus by faith. We need to take in God's word daily. We need to join with others in responding to God and his word in obedience. And we need to be challenged personally. I don't want to be a professional Christian. I don't want to be excited about Jesus just because... I'm your pastor, and you ask me to be excited about Jesus. I want Jesus to be my first love, and I want to I live and move among you and evidence that by my faith, and I bet you want the same thing too. This passage encourages us to evidence saving faith that depends on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Even for hard passages, even for passages that we read on the surface and, ah, oh, I don't quite know how that works. Thank you that you have given us minds that can think and put things into categories. You've given us inquiring minds that, 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 that help us to get into the text and ask hard questions about how words and phrases and ideas were used in their original context. And thank you that in, 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 in the Christian faith there are answers that sometimes require some work, but those answers are there. Help us, Lord, to be people who are rooted in history, which involves mainly the cross of Jesus. Help us, Lord, as we read your word and we respond in obedience. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. What are you doing this week to prepare yourself? Now, we're living in some really hard times 
and those hard times are going to get that much more difficult. And I want to challenge, just as, as Pastor was challenging us this morning, is what are we doing to prepare ourselves for the, the, the scenarios that will come our way? And uh, realizing as well that our faith is rooted in the grace of Christ. It's rooted in the grace of Christ, and out of that faith flows the works that uh, are a reflection of the real image of Jesus Christ. Let's stand this morning, and uh, just we're going to end our service with a, a reflection on the grace of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace. First Corinthians 15, 58 is going to close our service today. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work, that is righteous deeds in this sense, the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And as we move around this week and we encounter highs and lows, things that make us excited and things that are hard, let's remember that our labor in the Lord is not in vain because it evidences the saving faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that that is true for you. Go in peace. Have a great week in the Lord. And we'll see you again really soon.